Hi, my name is AJ Goldsby. I'm a life master from Pensacola, Florida, and I'm coming back today to bring you part four in my video series on the chess game between Grandmaster Wesley So and Grandmaster Alexei Shirov. This is from the Siegemann and Company tournament um, played in 2011. I believe it was in June 10th, 2011. This is round two. And Wesley So wins this game. It's a brilliant game, a very, very high level game. And uh, it's over a veteran grandmaster, uh, Alexei Shirov, someone who's been a candidate. At one time, he had defeated Kramnik and was uh, standing in line. He should have played a match with Kasparov for the world championship. I'm not really sure exactly why that match didn't happen, except that maybe a lot of people, sponsors, were afraid that, you know, he would not do well in that match. But uh, anyway, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a very high-level player, uh, Alexei Shirov. Um, we're talking about uh, a player that is the product of the Russian system and at one time was a top-10 player in the world. And uh, so this, uh, to date, I believe, is one of So's greatest and, and best wins. And we're going to go, I've already covered the uh, first uh, 17 moves, I believe it is, in, in the first three parts of this video. So now we're just going to quickly run through those moves and try to get to the uh, part where we left off in part three. Again, this is part four of my video series. Let's quickly run through those moves. D4, D5. Starts off as a Slav. White plays this unusual B2, B3 move here. And uh, that's not bad. And like I said, I already covered that in part one. And uh, that's just an unusual variation, but it's not terrible. Uh, some grandmasters have played that, but it's much less traveled than the main line, which would probably be the Moran system. And moving on, black just continues developing logically, as does white. Bishop b2, queen e7. Now here, if I was white, I would simply castle. So decides to go ahead and outpost his knight on e5. This is an extremely powerful move. Usually, if I'm going to stick my knight on an outpost, I don't like to do it in the opening. For, you know, first things first, let's get castled and then worry about middle game ideas. But, uh, you know, so obviously knows what he's doing. Uh, and there's a very real danger, I guess, Shirov's concern that White might reinforce this with F4. And if he's allowed to do that, then this knight on E5 may never, he may never get rid of it not, or not successfully. It'll just be too, too strong. So because of that idea, I think Shirov decides he's going to take immediate steps to, uh, to rid himself of the knight. Clearly, according to theory and according to the chess engines, uh, Black should have simply castled. That would have probably been the best move there. And then if he wanted to, he maybe could have played a move like castles and then 98 and F6 and maybe kick this knight. So there's one idea. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, Sheriff decides he takes immediate steps to rid himself of this knight. He plays bishop b4 check. Um, we're just going to continue to run through these moves. Knight d2, knight takes e5, d takes e5, knight d7, a3. That was a very good move. Taking advantage of this bishop being on a rather exposed square, of, you know, on b4. Bishop a5, white castles. Here, white has a very uh, nice, solid uh, edge out of the opening. And here, black, again, probably should castle. Uh, he's going to have a slightly constricted game. I mean, that can't be helped, but I think that's still his probably his best move. And black decides to play f6. And hit, the reason being is this pawn on e5 cuts the chessboard in half. And, uh, you know, Shirov decides he doesn't want to play the rest of the game with that pawn on that square. I mean, literally, it, it's it's cutting the chessboard in half and preventing his pieces from reaching ideal squares. So he decides he basically wants to try to get rid of it. He plays f6. White plays 13, knight f3. Bishop c7. Now white's forced to exchange off the pawn. He takes f6. Knight takes f6. And... 95, that's, uh, again, we see, you know, we just can't get a, keep a knight. Uh, so is very persistent. You know, first he had one knight, now he's got another knight on e5. So, you know, we see that theme that white's trying to dominate that e5 square. This is the second time a knight has invaded e5. Black castles, white plays f4. That's a very good move. It reinforces, you know, the uh, outpost on e5. And basically now white has just a stranglehold on the center. Uh, black has some minor control over e4 but he lacks the peace coordination to really take advantage of it. And also with whites, you know, if he could get a bishop to, say, h7, and if this bishop weren't on d3, he might be all right, because then he could, you know, he would have a, a square, a firm foothold on the center as well. But, you know, this light-squared bishop, that's one of the themes also of this game, is this light-squared bishop, black has a lot of problems trying to bring this piece into play. Bishop d7, and now white plays this move, rook f3. And this is where we left off in part three, and we'll go ahead and pick up our analysis from here. 
And uh, basically, the opening is pretty much over. Now we've entered the middle game. Both sides have already castled. And white has some very brutal threats here. Ideas maybe of rook h3, g2, g4, g5, and then h7 dies, or just queen c2. Another idea here is just simply bring everything, what I call do a student body right. White could just play queen c2. King, well, actually, I'd probably play king h1 first, then queen c2, then rook play r a g1 the queen would be on c2 would be out of the way and then play g4 g5 and rook h3 and again you get all of your pieces literally pointed at your opponent's king uh i can tell you from experience you know good things are going to happen and shirov of course knows this he's you know you don't become a top 10 grandmaster which he's not currently a top 10 grandmaster but he was in the past you know a, a top 10 grandmaster and at one time uh after defeating kramnik in a match he should have played kasparov you know, for the world championship, that didn't materialize, but you don't get to that, that kind of level without a deep understanding of chess. And also too, I just wanted to do this one more time. We'll go ahead and show you the, uh, the ideas after F4, these colorized, all these arrows here, this shows some of the many paths and, you know, routes that white's pieces might take. The rook can go to F3 to H3. The queen can come to C2 or even uh, B3 if the pawn goes to B4. The bishop dominates this square. Possibility of a sack or this knight getting driven away off of f6. I mean, you just see there's a whole multitude, a wealth of ideas there for white. But uh, anyway, white plays f4, and then black plays bishop d7, and now white plays rook f3. And as I said, you know, white has the ideas of just simply transferring all of his firepower to point directly at the black king. This literally forces such a powerful idea, I don't think Shirov can allow it. I mean, I analyzed this with game with engines. I spent literally months working on this game. And I can tell you quite confidently that if Shirov allowed White to, to succeed in pointing all of his pieces at his king, he would have lost horribly. And of course, Shirov's a good enough player to, to, to realize this without using a chess engine. I'm sure he figured this out over the board. And that's why now Shirov basically begins what I consider to be desperate measures. It's almost like a last ditch idea. He, he begins to do something to try to prevent White from realizing the plans that I just outlined. He's going to play bishop e8, white plays queen c2, and now, you know, we're reaching a crucial point. Again, you know, the ideas are just, you know, white's about to point all of his pieces at the black king. So now black decides he's got to get rid of that knight on e5. He plays bishop takes e5, just exchanging off the knight. White, of course, takes with the bishop. You could also take with the pawn there, but the bishop's much better. I don't think you really want to block the travel way of that bishop, turn a good bishop into a bad bishop by recapturing with the pawn. And uh, now, you know, again, White has two bishops, and he can literally, you know, put his king in the corner and play, you know, rook g1 and and g2, g4, and rook h3. And again, black would be in dire straits. So black's basically got to get some material off the board, and he's got to try to block some of these center lines. So now he plays the move knight e4. Now, this is a, a very good move. I mean, this is a very high-class move, and... and Shirov is uh, uh, a good enough chess player to realize that one of the ways that you prevent your opponent from carrying out his plan is to dramatically change the uh, balance, the material balance, the positional balance of the position. And that's what this 94 move does. It's just a very tricky move. And it's uh, basically black is offering a pawn sacrifice. Of course, when I first looked at this game, I thought to myself, oh, gee whiz, you know, white can just capture a pawn and be a pawn up. But then things are not so easy. When you begin investigating this with engines and get into the deeper analysis, you realize the win of a pawn alone doesn't guarantee White a good game. In fact, the win of the pawn, White winning the pawn, might guarantee Black a very good game. And that was probably exactly what Shiro had in mind here. Of course, White can't allow that knight on, to stay there on the e4 square. If that knight's allowed to stay on e4, then Black's not going to have any problems at all. So White immediately exchanges off the knight. Bishop takes e4. D takes e4. And of course, now White's got only one or two moves. He either has to capture the pawn on e4 or drop back his rook. Dropping back his rook looks like an insane idea. It looks like a loss of tempo and just looks like a very bad idea all around. And when I first went over this game, I'll be honest, I fully expected the capture queen takes pawn on e4. But Wesley Slow plays a move that I think is very fine and very refined. It shows a lot of subtleness. It shows a great deal of deep understanding of this position. He plays the move rook at f3 to f1, or just simply rf f1. And I give that a double x slam. And why, you know, you have to ask yourself, why did white play this move? You know, why is the move so good? 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, first of all, I've showed this game to literally dozens of players, and just about every person that I've showed this to, their first instinct, even another master at our chess club, was to go ahead and grab the pawn on e4. Uh, all my students, all the lower-rated players, you know, they obviously automatically were thinking about taking the pawn on e4. Um, White didn't do that, so you have to ask yourself, why didn't White take the pawn? Well, the problem is, is A, if White takes the pawn, it releases this bishop here. This bishop, remember we talked earlier in the first three segments of this video series about how this bishop, this light squared bishop, has been a prisoner behind the pawn structure. So if White captures the pawn, the very first thing you're going to see is that the pawn becomes a, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, rather the bishop gets free. This pawn is an impediment. It's blocking the action of this bishop back here. And if White grabs that pawn, then Black's bishop is going to be free. Let me just show you what that would look like in a variation just really quickly. Um, let's look at the if White had taken the pawn, queen takes e4. This didn't happen. We're just analyzing or investigating why so decided not to take the pawn. Now, this is not an engine line. Normally, I give lines where it's just the first or second move of the engine every single time, and I don't vary from that. In this line, this is the line that isn't like that. The line doesn't contain any blunders. White doesn't play any overtly bad moves. But, you know, it's not the very first move of the engine every single time, especially not for white. And I did that for a reason. I wanted to play reasonable moves, moves that even a strong master might play, and just show you how black's plan can unfold. Basically, black would obviously play bishop g6, hitting the queen, queen d4, rfd8, gaining a tempo off the queen, queen b2, or queen c3 even. But, of course, if the queen went to c3, the rook would go to d3 with a gain of time. So b2 was probably best. b6, this is a good move here because... You know, Black's uh, getting ready to play a move like c5, and that'll prevent White from occupying, in other words, blocking the file with bishop to d4. So that's another reason to play the move b6. White plays h3 simply because he doesn't have a good move here. I'm not exactly sure what the engines might play or might consider best, but White really right now doesn't have a really good move. Rook d3, king h2, ra d8, bishop d4. Now we see the c5 move to unblock the file, bishop c3, and now it's just simply bishop e4. And at this point, we can actually say that Black has taken over the chessboard. He's gotten all of his pieces a good square. We have something called opposite colored bishops. And Andy Soltis wrote a book called Pawn Structure Chess. And he explained that in heavy piece endings with a lot of pieces on the board, uh, sometimes being a pawn up or a pawn down is not nearly as important as the idea of which side has the most player, which side has targets to attack. And here right now, the only target that Black has is this pawn here, and if White plays like rook g3, he can simply play g6. And it's not clear that, you know, White can make any inroads there. But uh, anyway, um, um, the bottom line is, or if he plays rook g3, maybe Black just simply plays bishop to g6 and simply blocks the g-file. And, you know, White can't make progress. And uh, anyway, you can analyze this position with an engine if you'd like. I've already done that, and there's no doubt in my mind that... Um, um, uh, Black's okay, and he has he's in no danger of losing. And that was confirmed also by a very respected analysis on the uh, Chess Game website. Uh, his handle is uh, Random Visitor, and uh, he is known for very deep analysis with the computer. And I had him also check this line and check this, you know, the pawn capture. And, and that line, that uh, analysis is posted on the uh, Chess Game's webpage for this game, so you can confirm that. But anyway. Uh, you know, what so does is he plays RFF1. Again, that's a very deep move. That's a very grandmasterly move. The idea is to simply not capture the pawn, leave the pawn on the chessboard as a roadblock, permanent roadblock to Black's light squared bishop. And remember earlier, we had already identified the theme. One of the themes that White would persistently try to do is that we would try to prevent Black's light squared bishop from ever finding a really good you know, post in this game, and that's exactly what happened. So that RFF1 was a very masterly move, a very deep move that showed very deep understanding of the game. And you're going to see that, so that his plan doesn't end there. I mean, his plan is multifaceted, and it goes very deep into the position. And I see here I'm running a little long, so this is we're going to cut this off and call this the end of part four. We'll go and just show Black's move. Black plays a move. He finally activates or semi-activates his bishop. It's really behind a pawn, so it's not such a great square, but he does get it to the g6 square. And we'll pick up 
the um, this chess game with part five in the video series, and we'll start with White's 22nd move. I hope you'll watch that, and thank you for watching my video, and have a great day.